coming up next on Keys to Kingdom Living. We all have it. Sometimes it's, it's like a rash, it just breaks out. Sometimes you can get it medicated. You have some peace going on. You can go to sleep, kind of get a witness. But for the most part, Satan likes to come over there and, and just stir you up and then throw gas on the fire and then stand back and watch you burn. <laughs> All I got to do is initiate it. They do the rest. I just irritate them. They go to scratching. Look what James said. Where do wars and fights come from among you? You ever been in a church fight broke out? We did over in Tacoa. It was the first church, too. I thought they were dignified until they didn't get their way. Then they became justified, crucified the man behind the pulpit. He says, where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that what? They war in your members. Even though you're saved, you have pleasures that war in your member against the law of God in your mind. You lust. You covet and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask a myth that you might spend it upon your pleasures. Read on. Adulterers, adulteresses, do you not know that what? Friendship with the world is enmity with God. So if we become allies with the world, we have turned against our own Savior. So we have to guard our hearts against that war that goes on in our members that says, go ahead and retaliate. Go ahead and do what you wanted to, even though God's Spirit telling you don't do it. When you do that, you make yourself an enemy of God. So God didn't just save you so you could live for eternity, but he also saved you that you might give him glory while living in this sin-filled world for him. This is the ultimate test of true salvation. If you are truly saved, then there will be conflict, but the big war has already been won. Jesus stripped all principalities and powers and displayed them openly on the cross. And when God sent you his spirit and saved you out of the world, you won the greatest battle you will ever fight. But just because that victory has been won, we still in the flesh, and the enemy like to fight us in the flesh. We don't war against flesh and blood. We war against principalities, power, spirits, wickedness, and high places. So he comes at us in the flesh, in our weakest, in our Achilles heels, if you will. The Lord told me that there would be people here today that are warring with their salvation and they're tired and are considering returning to their old lifestyle. The Lord wants you to love him with all your heart. Say that with me. Love the Lord with all your heart, your soul, and your strength so that he can then empower you to win the war that Satan has already lost at Calvary. It's already been won, but by faith we wasn't there. It says, when Christ was crucified, I was crucified with him. Well, guess what? I wasn't there. So how can I obtain that victory? By faith. Wait a minute. It's faith that gives me the victory that overcomes this world. So the enemy tries to hogtie you and hurt you to try to convince you that God has abandoned you and you're in this world all by yourself. And it creates that war inside of you. Right? But God says, I've got the key to it. If you will love me, Lord says, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might, then I will empower you to win this war that is going on in your members. I will. You see, if you have accepted Christ, then you have already won. But that doesn't mean that Satan's going to let you go without a fight. Didn't Pharaoh pursue Israel into the Red Sea? He pursued, didn't he? But God consumed the Israel's enemies and still does so today. Pray that America doesn't do the same that, that Egypt has tried to do. You see what I'm saying? 
God loves America, but if America turns their heart against Israel, we a big creek without a paddle. Amen. When Christians become allies with the world's ways, they also become an enemy of God. Yes. Until you make the decision to love the Lord your God with all your heart and to keep and honor His word, the enemy of your soul will use the lack of commitment in your life to cause a raging fire to consume your peace, your joy, and your power. And that's where a lot of carnal Christians are right now. I want to preach this until somebody gets free in this house. You see, we got people that are not sold out to God confessing Jesus is Lord, but they don't want to submit and trust God, and they have a war raging in, and they're like prunes and prunes and bitter grapes. And when you talk to them, they're angry at God, and they'll be angry at you if you take his side. Whew. And it's all because they don't want to sell out to God. And so God says, wait a minute, guys. I'm not against you. All I want you to do, I saved you. All I want you to do is get on my side. The Lord of hosts came out when Joshua was fighting. Joshua had been fighting and fighting and fighting and fighting. He was, just, he was, he was in that mindset of fighting. And he came up on the Lord of hosts and he pulled out his, pulled out his sword. And he looked at the Lord of hosts and says, you, you for us or against us? The Lord of hosts says, I'm on neither side. You better get on my side. You better submit to me. Put your sword up, Peter. Better get that warrant out of you. Did you hear what the Spirit is saying? Because that war, if you don't, if you don't surrender to God over that war, that war will consume you. You will lose your joy, and the joy of the Lord is your strength, and you'll want to backslide and go back into the thing you said you'd never touch again. People are so gullible. They, 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 they think it's a church thing. I can come to church, I can hear a good sermon, I can go live my life, and everything's hunky-dory. And they have heard lies that says, well, once you saved, you in, and Satan can't touch you now. And then they come up against this spiritual battle. And because they have not become equipped or gotten equipped by preachers that want to have a backbone and tell them the truth, you're going to be tested, you're going to be tried. Then instead of having the arsenal of words to pull from, they pull out of their flesh and try to fight this thing in the flesh. And when they lose, they blame God for forsaking them in the middle of the battle. And God says, I'm with you, but you have no faith in me. I don't think God's apologizing today. I think he's a little on the, I've had it up to here stage. First John, First John chapter 2, verse 15. Are you okay? Yes. It's going to get better. First John 2.15, are you there? Do not love the world. He's talking to Christians here, right? You want to know how much in love with the world you are? You want to really find that out? Let somebody do you wrong. Let somebody take something that is rightfully yours wrongfully. Buddy, that robe of righteousness is the first thing that comes off for a lot of people. I'm saved on Sunday, but today your backside's mine. See, now God says, wait a minute. Be still and know that I am God. I am the Lord your God, and I will restore to you the years, the, the, the locust and the, the... Ah, you just full of it, the fair preacher. You ain't never gone through nothing. Because when people can't handle the word, they attack the messenger. God says, if he says be still, and they're stealing you blind, there's a reason. He's wanting to see. Do you love the world more than your faith in God? Because he was the one that gave it to you. Naked I came in, and naked I'm going to go. And in all that Job went through and all that he lost, he didn't fool, uh, charge God foolishly, nor did he sin against God. He says, it's God's. 
If he wants to burn it down, let him burn it down. I'm giving me a new one in nine months. <laughs> now, who told Job there's a reward after all this hell? God did. It's Satan that wanted to turn Job against God. He says, love not the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone, look at it, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is what? Not in him. For all that is in the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, and is not of the Father, but is of the world. The world is what? Passing away, and the lust of it, but he who what? Does the will of God abides how long? Huh. As your pastor, it causes me deep grief and concern when I see God's people fighting the war within them, especially if their heart isn't fully committed to their faith. You can't serve God and have it your way all the time. It ain't going to work. One of you's got to be God. Watch this. There comes a time in every believer's life when God has to show Satan that you belong to the Lord now and Satan can't have you. You ever had that occasion where God says, all right, Satan, he belongs to me now. You can pull all your little tricks you want to, but you ain't going to get him. And God will give you that chance. Have you had that chance lately? If you ain't, get ready. Because Jesus said, all that the Father has given me, I have kept, except the son of perdition that the scriptures might be fulfilled. And he said, those that the Father has given me, no man has plucked out of my hand. Now, turn with me to Luke 22. I want to show you something, and I'm going home. Luke 22, 20. Lord showed me this, and it's like, wow, God, that's good. <laughs> Luke twenty two twenty. This is the night that Jesus is going to be betrayed. There's a lot of junk happens on the night Jesus gets betrayed. I mean, a whole lot of stuff happens. He says in verse 20, Likewise he took of the cup after supper, saying, This is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for me. And he says, But behold, the hand of my betrayer is with me on the table. So they knew it was somebody in that room. And truly the Son of Man goes as it has been determined. But woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. So he's talking about who? Judas. Judas is one of his hand-picked disciples, is he not? But Judas hasn't sold out. Guess who was holding the, the bag of the treasury? Oh, Judy. He's one of those heathens that spoke up, says, Lord! When Mary poured out that 300 penny worth of uh, oil, oil and ointment on Jesus' head, says, Lord, that, that stuff shouldn't have been wasted. That should have been sold and helped the poor. It was so greedy, Judas. Sounded like he was out for God's best interest. He was so full of greed and sin, he reeked of it. But he came across religious. And Jesus finally says that he's going to, deceive, he's going to uh, betray y'all tonight. Now, while Jesus is talking about this betrayal, and he's fixing to be turned over to the Gentiles to be crucified, something jumps all over Simon. Look there in verse 31. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you that he might sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you return to me, strengthen your brethren. He says, Lord, you don't know what you're talking about. I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. And Jesus says, Peter, get a lie. You're going to deny me three times tonight before the rooster crows. Now watch. Satan had Judas, did he not? Here's the mistake Satan made. He says, since I have Judas, 
who gave himself over to me, he thought he could have Peter too. Because Peter was acting in the flesh. Jesus says, you acted so much in the flesh, Satan, get thee behind me. But there was a difference between Judas and Simon. And Satan didn't know about this. Peter had faith in Jesus, but Judas had faith in silver. <laughs> now the lights are coming on. Took us a while. And y'all wonder why I preach so long. See, if you love the world and the things in the world, you won't sell out to Christ. And if you don't sell out to Christ, when the test comes, you won't have the commitment nor the tenacity nor the power to resist the devil when he comes. And Judas was sold out to silver, but Simon was silently sold out to Jesus. And when the sifting came, Judas hung himself and Simon preached on the day of Pentecost. Can I hear something in this house today? I may have a little time where I deny Christ, but you come cut my throat, and I guarantee you I'm going to bleed Jesus. I have sold out to him. And Jesus knows those that sold out. And he knows those that play around. So, he says, love me with all your heart. And when you do, you'll overcome that war. Now turn with me to Romans 6, please. Verse 1. Romans 6, 1 says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. God forbid. How shall we who what? Died. Saul of Tarsus died. And he had the right to say, I have wronged no man. How shall we who have named Christ as Jesus and Lord, how shall we live any longer in sin? Do you not know that those who have named Christ have died to sin? And do not live in it any longer? Or do you not know that as many as were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? That's how Paul could write in Galatians, When Christ died, I died with him. Because when he saved me, I was baptized into Christ. I was baptized into his death. He killed my old man. And I came up. It was not me, but it was Christ in me. The hope of glory that came up out of that grave. I may have times of weaknesses. I may have times of doubt. But I am not going to let this war inside of me and believe me you I've had some more up in here tell me I have allowed God to forsake me or he has forsaken me it ain't gonna happen cause I've tasted how can you be so cocky sure cause I have tasted and seen that the Lord is good and I've seen the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living more than one time now so why does Satan fight us now that we're Christians, turn with me to Genesis 22, 12. And I'll show you. Here's why Satan fights you. Abraham was in covenant with God by this time, was he not? Did Satan keep fighting him? You know he did. It's more than just saying I'm saved. I go to a church. Is saying, I live my life to please God. God has told him, take now your son, your only son, go to a mountain, I'll show you. And he gets up early and goes and does that. Now look down at verse 12. And he said, God said to Abraham, do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him, for I know. You see that? I know that you, he says, fear God, but you could go ahead and say that you love me more than your son. Since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. See, he obeyed when he, he was willing to sacrifice what he loved the most on earth. You see that? When God can trust you and ask you to lay down the thing you love the most in the earth, he's really trusting you to do that. God, I lay down the thing I love the most. And when you do that, God can then make a, 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 an oath over you that says, by, I swear by myself, by blessing I will bless you, and, and by multiplying I will multiply you. And he goes on to says, 
and, and says this, As the sand of the sea which is on the seashore and your descendants shall possess the gates of their enemies and in your seed all the nations shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. He was willing to love God more than his own son. And because of that, God could trust him. And God made an oath and a covenant with Abraham. He says, wait a minute, Abraham, I'm going to give you a little insight. You've been so caught up in this moment. I'm going to give you an eternal perspective. Okay, what is it, God? He says, you thought this was all about you. It had very little to do with you except your obedience because I need access into the world through obedience to bless your children, your children's children, your great-grandchildren, your great-great-great-great-great-grandchildren, and through them the nations of the world shall be blessed. You mean all this war, the 25 years of waiting on you to show up and get my wife pregnant, the time it took for Isaac to get grown up, and become old enough to where I could take him up on this. All of that has been brought to this point just so I would obey you so that my descendants could be blessed. Yeah. Because, watch, the war, here's why Satan fights you, guys. The war that you're fighting now is not about now. It's about your seed and your seed seed because, listen, generational obedience brings generational blessings. Disobedience brings generational cursings. She read me something out of uh, Perry Stone's book that blew my mind. How many knows Joseph Kennedy? 1800s. He was the son of uh, President John F. Kennedy, Robert Kennedy, and what was the other one? Yeah, the father. And uh, which, the other one? Ted Kennedy. He was so responsible for bringing liquor into the United States, Joseph Kennedy was. And through that, has polluted a lot of homes and destroyed a lot of families' life through the liquor, hard liquor. And, and so, Perry Stone is very good in research. He researched this out, and he showed all of the, what happened to Joseph Kennedy's children and his grandchildren. Cut short. To the third and the fourth generation. Do you see that? That's why Satan fights you right now. Have we not had war in the last four years spiritually like we have never known in our lifetime? That tells me Satan is going about his roaring line because God is about to bless somebody in a time of temptation. And listen, if you will overcome the war in your mind and the war in your members and you will submit to me and trust me, I will see to it that you will be blessed and your seed will be blessed. This is a crucial moment for the children of God to submit to God. Turn with me to 2 Samuel. We're done. I don't want to go to church, God. I don't want to do it, God. Second Samuel twelve seven. David has had a little fling going on inside. And he's kept it hush hush. But he gets the girl pregnant. Happens that the girl was married. So to cover that up, he commits murder. And he has it all nice and neat in his little closet. Nobody knows it. But one little problem. This king had a prophet. His name was Nathan. Then Nathan said to David, You are the man. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I anointed you, look at this, I anointed you king over Israel, I delivered you from the hand of Saul. See, he had battles, did he not? I gave you your master's house, he won those battles, and he got the, the spoil. I, got, I gave you your master's wives into your keeping, and gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if it had, not been, to, if it had been too little, I also would have given you much more. Why? Look at it. Why have you despised the commandment of the Lord? There was something that God told him to do, and he would not do it because he wasn't feeling like he was getting his just rewards. 
If you were not here Wednesday night, I beg you, I beg you, get a copy of Wednesday nights. Uh, beware of the spirit of entitlement. He says, you despise the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight. You have killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword. You have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the people of Ammon. Now, therefore, the sword, look at it. He had a war going on in his members. It's called L-U-S-T and covet, right? He coveted his neighbor's wife. And because of this war, he gave in to it. Now, therefore, look what's going to happen. Because you, Christian, gave in to this, the sword shall never depart from your house because you despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up adversity against you from your own house, and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor, and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of this son. You did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel. And before the sun. People think God is so passive. Just do what you want to. As long as you don't cut them off in traffic, you're all right. God wants you to know. That's Old Testament. Yes, you're right. Turn to Galatians 6 and, and read what Paul said under the anointing. He says, if you sow to the flesh, you will of the flesh reap corruption. That word corruption means to decay and die. He said, because you have done this and you allowed that war inside of you to become a war in your hand, now that sword will never leave your house. And there was death in David's house, was there not? Yes. So how do I get out of this war that I have in my members that fights me when I want to do what God says? You've got to trust God. Now watch. When God tells you, this, how do I trust God? I'm glad you asked. Here's how you trust God. When God tells you to do something, and it goes against everything in your mental capacities, or your emotional capacities, or any other capacity, it goes against you, but you know it's thus saith the Lord. If you will go ahead and do it, that's trust. Right? But if you do not do it, then God says, okay, it was your disobedience because now you've drawn back in unbelief. And you have now opened up the door through your flesh for Satan to come in and to devour. Now you're going to have a circumstance that makes you, that will make you trust me. Got it? You ever gone through a circumstance, you said, God, you're just going to have to carry me through this because I don't, I, I, I don't have faith to get through this. You ever been there? I have. He says, all right, if you can trust me in that circumstance, then why can't you trust me when there's not a circumstance and I just asked you to do something? Why does God have to force those who say they love him to trust him? Why? Because they're not sold out. If you sold out, you'll trust. Amen? Amen. Do you love me? Yeah. <laughs> Stand your feet. For 2,000 years, people have wrestled with who he is. Embark on a journey with Pastor Asa Dockery in his new book, The Greatest Revelation, to find out more about the true identity of Jesus. Order online now at whcnorth.org. When you sow into this ministry with a gift of $50 or more, Pastor Asa wants to give you his latest audio series entitled Discipleship 101, Making Disciples of All Nations, and as a bonus, his latest book, The Greatest Revelation can't seem to find time to get into God's Word? Need an encouraging word at the right moment? Pastor Ace's daily devotions are available on our website at whcnorth.org. Use the Devotions tab and simply add your email address in the box provided or download the app for your smartphone. We pray that you've been impacted by today's message. If you need more information or would like to contact us, visit us on our website at whcnorth.org or contact us by phone at 706-374-6175.
To write us, our address is P.O. Box 968, Morganton, Georgia, 30560. Our campus is located at 135 Bud Franklin Drive, Blairsville, Georgia, 30512.